lovely to be here. I, uh, I do quite a few keynotes, but my absolute priority is always doing small intimate groups. I absolutely love the more of the human connection of smaller groups like this. So what I'm going to be doing is a, a sort of cross between a, a tedx -y type talk, but with some interaction as well. Um, the talk will be relatively short because I really want to put you guys on the stage. So you are not going to get away with me talking for the next hour. Um, I'm really wanting everybody to make a contribution to this session and to, um, to leave with something actionable and something that you feel like you could take back into your workplace once you leave. Um, so here we go. So in 2010, uh, I was a burnt out and uh, totally disengaged marketer. Has anyone had a period like that in their career before? Come on, put anyone who hasn't had a period like that in their career before? Wow. Well, that's going to prove the theory that I, that I am going to uh, share with you. So um, after a 20-year career in the corporate world and in my own business, I was working at Westpac and Merrill Lynch and then running my own marketing business. I decided that um, I just simply couldn't be a marketer anymore. Um, I'd fallen out of love with my profession. I pretty much didn't want to be spreading any more lies for companies who were selling crap that I didn't want to market. So I made this decision that I just wanted to give it all up and start all over again. So just like that, I sold my home, I gave away all my possessions and I closed my business and I took my 12-year-old son, Billy, to live in beautiful Aix-en-Provence in the south of France. Yes, girls, I had an eat, pray, love experience. <laughs> um, and guys, all those guys who might have read that book. And um, the, for six months, while Billy went to school, I went about recovering my health and well-being. I became a recovering marketer, hence why Caitlin introduced me as a reformed marketer. And um, Th that, that experience changed the trajectory of my life and mostly because it gave me the career circuit breaker I needed to explore my purpose, my why, and, and in particular with regards to my future livelihood and what I was going to do with the rest of my career. Um, and I didn't go searching for that purpose in the bottom of a wine glass or in the arms of a French lover. I actually did it by, uh, through journaling. So um, journaling has been the tool that I've used over the last uh, five years to help gain uh, a lot of clarity around life direction and purpose and meaning. And one of the things I always recommend to people is to find that tool, whether it's journaling, meditation or whatever. Um, but that's a whole topic for another talk. So. It, the thing is, I know that I'm not alone. Millions and millions of people around the world feel like I felt in 2010 before I went to France. And a 2012 Gallup poll shows that a mere 13% of people are engaged at work, which means 87% are either not engaged or they're actively disengaged. 87%. So what we're saying is that these people are having a negative impact on the organisation, they're having a negative impact on the people that they work with, they're having a negative impact on their own lives, not to mention their, their families as well. So it would seem that 87% of us are making a dying instead of a living at work. And if you think about how much time we spend at work, maybe up to a third of our life, it's a pretty tragic statistic to contemplate, isn't it? So how do we turn this tragic statistic around? How do we bring life back to work? I believe the answer is simple and profound and the answer lies in reorienting both people and the companies that they work for towards a higher purpose than profit. Now I'm not Robinson Crusoe on this whole idea of purpose. This has been written about by philosophers, by um, writers and now by business leaders. Um, there are many, many people that have talked about this idea of higher purpose than profit. Uh, and I'll throw this, I'll do a little pop quiz. Who said follow your bliss? Anyone? Anyone? Uh, there's, a, 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 there's a line called follow your bliss. Who was the famous person that said that? Joseph Campbell said that. 
And there was another line, um, the two most important days in your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. Mark Twain, thanks Rory. And then this one. Explore this next great frontier where the boundaries between higher and purpose and work merge into one, where doing good really is good for business. Who said that? Yes. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone knows him. Ralph no. Okay. Richard Branson. Yeah. So there are a lot of people that are talking about this, but my favourite is Viktor Frankl. Now, Viktor Frankl is a psychotherapist and he wrote the seminal book on purpose called Man's Search for Meaning. Has anyone read that book? If you want to explore purpose, start with that book. It's an incredible book. So Viktor Frankl practiced, he was um, interned in the German concentration camp and as a, he, he practiced a form of psychoanalysis called logotherapy. And logotherapy is derived from the word logos, which is the Greek word for meaning. And while he was in the camp, he actually was practicing this, this um, therapy with, on himself, but also with other, uh, of his in, uh, other prisoners, prisoners. And logotherapy is really about orienting people towards meaning. When he got out of the concentration camp, he then went on to conduct some research at the John Hopkins University in the US. And he actually asked nearly 8,000 students what is most important to them on leaving university. And 16% said it was making lots of money and 78% said it was finding purpose and meaning. So I'm just trying to set the context here that this discussion around purpose and meaning is something that's been going on for many, many years. So if purpose, and pur if purpose is so important, why is it that so few of us have actually pursued it? Why is it that so many of us have not pursued purpose? Well, I blame the industrial age. So clearly this age brought us many great innovations and, um, and, and great advancements, but it also cheated us out of finding our purpose. And obviously it was the age of the factories and the assembly line and the economic system was built on the mass production of products where increasingly demand was fueled by mass promotion and advertising for the single-minded pursuit of profit. So we sort of had an economic system which was about product plus promotion. You can see my marketing bit coming out here, can't you? <laughs> Equals profit. And what became dispensable in the industrial age were people and our planet Earth. And we created an economic system where um, we were all simultaneously turned into consumers and workers and the more we consumed, the more we needed to earn and the more we needed to work and so on goes the cycle. And the more we became dulled to our true potential and diverted away from our purpose. But clearly we've moved on from the industrial age and we're firmly in the grip of the technology age. Would everyone agree with that? So companies are spending billions and billions of dollars on technology in order to remain relevant and competitive and they're seeing it as the new oil. They're seeing it as that very thing that's going to make them more profitable than ever. But what I believe most companies are very, very ill prepared for is a new age that we're entering right now. And I call that age the human age. And this is the age where meaning is fast becoming the new money and where purpose is going to prevail. So I predict that in the next 10 years that the biggest disruption in the business world isn't actually going to come from advancements in technology. It's actually going to come from advancements towards purpose, where technology is merely going to be the great enabler of purpose. And uh, there's a few things we know um, why that's happening. Um, firstly, uh, us consumers and, and us workers, I mean us humans, we're waking up. There's a mass flowering of consciousness and awareness on the planet. 
and we're choosing not to work from, invest in or buy from companies that are not putting purpose before profit. You ask any of the millennials, that next generation down, who they're going to work for, they will not work for companies that do not put humanity and the planet before their pocket. They simply won't. They have too many options. They'll become digital nomads. They'll become entrepreneurs. They'll have five or six different sources of revenue, whether that's through Airbnb, Uber, you know, having their own business. So the challenge that most companies are going to face, if they actually don't understand what that next generation, what drives that next generation, which is intrinsic motivation around purpose, those companies are not going to attract the best people. They're not going to keep the best people and they're not going to attract that next generation. And that's why I believe that in the next 10 years, companies have to seriously address this idea of having a higher purpose than profit. So the human age represents an opportunity for us to reframe um, it into a new model. And the new model is one where a company um, has a higher purpose that unites and inspires people while having deep consideration of the planet and ensuring that everyone is prosperous. Now, I could have a whole day's talk around the value of shifting a profit-driven mindset to a prosperity-driven mindset. I believe that they are very, very different concepts and that this is very holistic and this is very singular. But in the human age, when we operate from this planet, it's from this platform that companies will build the most enduring and sustainable products that people will want to buy and that will require no mass promotion because people will buy your why. They'll buy this. They'll buy what you stand for, not just what you're selling. And this is where purpose actually ends up being the new marketing. And this is where also you turn from moving from a, track, from a promotion marketing into attraction marketing. We're shifting, shifting the playing field. So, So let's just dig a little bit deeper on this idea of purpose. Has anyone heard of Ikigai? Ikagi? I don't know how to say it. Who knows? You've been to Japan, Margaret. Have you heard of that word? Ikagai. Ikagi. A I K A G A I. And no amount of Google translations, you know how you do the. <laughs> has actually come up with how to say it. Ikagia. No, it's AI. Anyway, so the, the Japanese actually were the originators of this notion of purpose. And Ikagia, Ikagai, I'm just going to say Ikagai, <laughs> actually um, uh, means reason for being. And the Japanese devised this model, which is four, concentric, four circles that actually uh, they believe that when people explore these full circles, then they will achieve their full potential in life. So, I'm going to draw the model for you. Um, what I will do after this, I'm going to send you also a white paper with a lot of this content. So, if you're wanting to capture this, you will get um, an email with a lot of the stuff that I've been talking about. So, They believe that Ikigai is in here. And the first circle is, what are you good at? So these, this is all about your skills and your talents and the things that you can deliver the world in terms of skills and talents. Fairly IQ based stuff, rational, functional skills. In this circle, it's what you love. This is what you're passionate about. In this circle, it's what the world needs. And I'm talking into the whiteboard, so I'm sorry about that. And in this circle, it is what makes the bucks. And they believe that you need a balance of all of those independently, but if you can collectively bring them together, then you've found 
that purpose and meaning that you want to have in life. In here, we use the word passion. Passion and purpose are words that are often inter um, interchanged in, in, the, in the discussion around purpose. And over here, we have mission. In here, we have profession. And over here, we have vocation. And there's a whole lot of stuff on Wikipedia around this. So when I work with individuals and also with companies, we actually deeply explore this model and we work out how can we cross the intersections of all of those in order to find what our purpose piece is. So before I went to France, I was being paid well for using my skills and talents, but I was not doing work I was passionate about and I wasn't, hadn't even considered what the world needed. And these two circles had not even been contemplated in my work. So it wasn't until I came back five years ago that I really started exploring how we can bring all of these concepts into, into our livelihood. But let's now just have a look at company purpose. Would you agree everyone's talking about it? Have you, have you seen stuff in the market, everyone's saying, oh, we need a new company purpose? Yeah? Have you, you heard about it? Your executive teams are talking about it. You know, the media is talking about it. And um, from my observation, it seems to be the new black. From my observation, most companies are taking a really superficial approach to it. They're treating it as a way to sexy up the old mission statement and they're also, or as an advertising line aimed at the consumer. What they're not understanding that purpose isn't the new black, it's the new imperative and it is going to become as essential to us, uh, to a company as breathing is, is to us humans. And purpose from a company perspective answers a number of core questions. It asks why are we here, what is the contribution we are making, and how is the world better because we exist? Purpose helps shift us from how we are being best in the world to being better for the world. I see many purpose statements that are about being best, being the leading, being the number one, blah, blah, blah. How you measure that is beyond me anyway. <laughs> how do you measure that one company's best um, according to their competition? That's actually a line that's used by B Corporations and B Lab. Does anyone know about certified B Corps and B Lab? That'll be in the paper, another link that you can have a look at. So it's about shifting from being wanting to be best in the world to being better for the world. And purpose um, really is the glue of the organisation and it's the guiding North Star and it's ever present and it's never reachable. But it's about intent, it's about behaviour, it can be felt, it can be seen, it can be heard. Everyone knows what the purpose of the organisation is and it actually affects everything they do in their work. Decisions in the company are made only when tested against the purpose of the organisation. So, um, some great examples of companies that are on purpose are Etsy and Whole Food Markets and uh, Patagonia has an awesome purpose statement. Um, Lululemon has an awesome purpose statement. I'll, I'm gonna, I'll share you a couple of purpose statements. And I'll also say just because you have one, a purpose statement doesn't mean you're on purpose. <laughs> Many companies would have one. So, um, Lululemon is to elevate the world from mediocrity to greatness. Everyone knows the Lululemon Active Wear brand? Yeah? Interface carpets to create a sustainable future with zero emissions by 2020. Huddle. What is it, Caitlin? Correct, you get a gold star. <laughs> um, and last year when I delivered this talk for TEDx Telstra, 
Um, at the end of the talk, there were 200 staff in the audience. Is anyone here from Telstra, by the way? <laughs> okay. So um, I'm not going to say anything negative about them. I actually think they've got an awesome purpose statement. So their purpose statement is to create a brilliant, connected future for everyone. And what I said to the audience was I said that um, you actually have a really good purpose statement. And you're probably doing as best as you can with that purpose from a telecommunications and a technological perspective. But what's the opportunity to humanise that purpose and bring that word connected to life? And I actually said to them, you don't need to wait to your leaders to bring that purpose to life. Each and every one of you in that room has the responsibility to take ownership of that purpose and do what you can within your own cubicle or wherever <laughs> to bring that word to life, to bring that purpose statement to life. So I believe that big companies that have got these purpose statements that are good purpose statements, that's where they need to start if they want to transform their culture. No amount of culture work, if they have a purpose statement, no amount of culture work done in the organisation will be effective unless that purpose statement is deeply, deeply addressed amongst all of their people. So um, hence why... I've at least got in the door with Telstra a little bit when I delivered this talk. They at least uh, were willing to hear. So with the whole idea of purpose, what I, what I believe is that we have to start by, in the centre by having a higher purpose. That purpose actually has to be more than a statement. It has to be come a collective purpose. Most companies will claim they have one but won't go beyond the executive team, the consulting firm or the ad agency. And actually I had an experience last year where I was doing a speaking gig and the head of learning and development announced the new purpose statement to their staff and then it was like, next, okay, what, what are we going to talk about next? And, and it, was, it was almost like they'd been given the pitch by the executive team to roll it out, but they really, you could just feel there was zero passion for this purpose. And I thought, they've wasted all that money on something that is really going to be very difficult to um, uh, activate in the organisation. So what does a collective purpose mean? A collective purpose means when everyone has a hand in creating it. It's no longer just the domain of the executive team and the ad agency and the consulting firm. It's where everyone in the organisation actually gets to participate in creating the purpose, activating the purpose. Everyone makes it their own and everyone takes responsibility for it. And a great example of a collective purpose is um, Keep Cup. Does anyone know the company Keep Cup? So, Keep Cup um, have been around for about seven years. They're a Melbourne-based company and they've sold five million cups in about 62 countries over that time. And um, they've prevented billions and billions of disposable coffee cups from ending up in landfill. And their purpose is to kick-start the demise of the disposable cup to kick-start the demise of the disposable cup. Now, I love my Keep Cup. I take it with me every morning when I go on my walk. I fill it up at my local coffee shop. And if I go into a coffee shop that doesn't stock them, I ask them why not, and I say, this is where you can buy them from. <laughs> I buy them as gifts for my family and friends. Sexy gifts, aren't they? <laughs> in fact, I'm a total pain in the ass about my Keep Cup. <laughs> But for me, that's how you tell when you have a collective purpose, when people like me, I have no financially vested interest in that company, but here I am standing up here talking to you about this product and telling everyone I can to get a keep cup. That to me is a collective purpose when everyone, even your competition, buy into your purpose. And in the competitive business environment that we're in, 
that says a lot to actually say, you know what, I'm not just going to have a purpose which is about being the best. I'm going to have a purpose that's about being better for the world. And I'm going to bring along all my competitors, perceived competitors on that journey. I think once we can get this piece nutted and we can really start to really create a collective purpose, that's when the power of the organ that's where you start solving culture problems, it's where you start keeping the best people, it's where you start attracting, you know, the, the best people as well. But I have another circle to add to the purpose equation. And to me, this is where I think the biggest opportunity is, and I have not yet seen it. This is like my wish for the world. And this is BYO purpose. And this is where the company becomes the arbiter and the curator of purpose in each of their people. So last year I was delivering this talk to a finance company, uh, to their staff. And uh, by the time I got home, I'd had an email from a woman called Karen. And she admitted to me that her true purpose was to deliver health and well-being programs and she was really into nutrition. And my talk had inspired her to go back and, and do her um, nutritional studies. She'd given them up. She had two years to go. She'd given them up. And she said, I'm going to finish them. Now, sadly, Karen's going to become a corporate SKP. I know that in two years, when she finishes her studies, she's going to end up starting her own business or going to work in the nutrition space for some other company. But what if that company looked beyond the KPIs and the job descriptions and they looked beyond the sales targets and they said to Karen, we'd love you to bring your passion and purpose into our workplace. What if they paid for her studies? What if they gave her time off to do her nutrition studies? What if they invited her to be the staff health and wellbeing advisor? Or what if she was able to combine her financial advice with health advice with her clients? Which, if you think about it, would make absolute sense because we all know that poor health can be financially devastating, don't we? Karen wouldn't actually have to become that corporate SKP. She'd be kicking her sales targets out of the park as well as healing the organisation, fulfilling her own passion, and those around her. That to me is where the hugest opportunity to transform a culture and to actually bring purpose to life rests. And you might think this is utopian and maybe it is but if we all start talking about this stuff and we as individuals we get the entrepreneurs that are in organisations to start talking about this and to really start taking responsibility and not leaving it to the leaders and the, the managers to actually kickstart it. This to me is where we can start to really start activating more meaning and purpose at work. So, we're going to get into some discussion in a minute. But for those of the cynics around here that are thinking, well, how does this purpose turn into profit? There's, many, there's a lot of evidence now that purpose-driven companies over the long term are more profitable and sustainable than those that are driven only by profit. So conscious capitalism is a movement that started in the US by John Mackey of Whole Food Markets and Raj Sasodia, who's an academic. And I first read Raj Sasodia's book, uh, Firms of Endearment, about five years ago. And in that book and in subsequent books, what they've done is they've measured a basket of purpose-driven conscious businesses against the S&P 500. And they measured their performance over 5, 10 and 15 years. And what they proved over five years, that the um, return on investment in five years was five times greater, in 10 years it was nine times greater, and in 15, 14 years it was 15 times greater. So they did a measurement of these basket of purpose-driven companies with, against the S&P 500. Now sadly there's not a lot in this basket to pull from, <laughs> but that 
does give us enough evidence that if we can reorient a company towards a higher purpose, that they can at least over the longer term start to keep, attract, retain people and therefore also become more sustainable and profitable. So there is a growing band of evidence and research around the globe that purpose-driven companies are more sustainable and profitable. So before we get into some discussion, maybe um, what I'd like to say is that um, five years ago when I went to France, I had no idea what I was going to discover. And I've been studying, living, breathing, researching, teaching, writing about this idea of higher purpose for the whole five years. And what I'm finding, even in that five years, the more often I have discussions, the more open people are to talking about it. I'm, I'm seeing a wave of people interested in this idea of bringing purpose to business, to the business world. And um, I don't know about you, but um, I have an 18-year-old son, Billy, and uh, I want him to live in a world that's better than the one that my generation and my parents' generation have created for him. And I think that, um, you know, that we are entering the human age, that um, meaning is becoming the new money, that profiting on purpose has to be our goal. Because the thing is, we owe it to future generations and we owe it to the planet. But most of all, I think we owe it to ourselves. <laughs> 